morning. Welcome to Ronces Vales United Church. It's Sunday, July 18th. And today we are celebrating the church that we love, the United Church of Canada. A few weeks ago, the United Church of Canada celebrated our 96th anniversary. That means in four years, we're going to be 100 years old. There have been a lot of changes during that time, which is a great thing. There have been a lot of highs, there have been some difficult times. We're going to talk a little bit about all of those, and then we're going to share with you some of the most important pieces of the United Church today. This is the church that we call home. This is the faith path where we look to find our spiritual growth, our spiritual community. I think it's a wonderful thing to do before we have a little bit of a break for the summer, and I'll talk about that later, to celebrate and to look a little more deeply into the United Church of Canada. We're going to begin by singing together, You Are a Part of the Family. If the United Church of Canada is anything, it's a family. Sometimes that means we don't get along, we see things differently, we struggle with each other. But it also means that we feel a deep tie to each other, a deep sense that we are meant to take this journey together, whatever that journey looks like. So thank you to Paul for playing. And you can sing along. We are a part of the family. want to say two things. This prayer sometimes gets stuck in my throat because it is so counterintuitive to everything that society tells me. It is me admitting that I'm letting go and for me that's something that's very hard. But the second thing I know is that when I do let go, I have a lot more joy and peace in my life. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today because I know it's for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change any situation condition, person, or myself. I open to the love and presence of God and God's action within. Amen. In July of 2018, in Oshawa, Ontario, at the General Council of the United Church of Canada, a national uh, event that takes place every three years, Richard Bott should have been having a moment of celebration. Out of many candidates for moderator, the leader of the United Church of Canada for the next three years, the spokesperson for the largest Protestant denomination in this country. He was getting ready for his inauguration speech, the speech he would deliver for the first time as the head of our amazing national church, the United Church of Canada. Richard Bott has beautiful words at his fingertips always, words of warmth, 
words of encouragement, words that support everyone. And he should have been putting those words together in this moment in 2018, moments before he gave his first address as moderator, in a way that allowed him to share his innate sense of joy. But something had happened a few moments before, even as Richard had just finished the finishing touches on the speech he would give as he was declared moderator. What happened was someone arrived in Richard's uh, dorm room and told him that something had happened in the afternoon session during the council meeting while Richard was preparing his speech in the big echoing room where all of the national delegates of the United Church of Canada were and had planned to spend the afternoon just passing a few mundane uh, motions, suddenly the energy and the story had turned. Suddenly, people had felt compelled to stand up, go to the microphone, and share difficult personal stories. Suddenly, in that afternoon, in that meeting, which was expected to be so ordinary, so routine, while Richard was writing that speech, people had presented their places of pain. Pain about how the church had excluded them. Pain about how the church had behaved to so many vulnerable groups. Pain about how the church had let them down as they personally quested for social justice and for the freedom of all. As this news was delivered to Richard, he had to make a quick decision. The first idea he had was simply to deliver his encouraging speech as it was. But the second was to realize that he was now ahead of an organization which did indeed confront the pain of lack of social justice on a regular basis. And that he, as a white, middle-class, heterosexual man, had something to say about that. So when Richard Bott stood up to speak, the speech he had planned was gone. And instead, he began with these words. I stand before you tonight as a person who has exactly one set of lenses. I'm white. I'm middle class, I'm university educated, I'm able-bodied, I'm middle-aged, I'm a dis male settler who grew up on lands that were unceded territory of the people of the land. I'm the epitome of privilege. Richard had in that moment located himself as someone aware of where he was in the world of the power that was available to him, in fact given to him without thought, of the ways in which he had been allowed to live in the world in a privileged manner. And he went on his speech to say, I will use my awareness to help all those who need to be privileged as well, who need to have the access I have had, who need to have their voice heard, as mine has so easily been heard. And at the end of Richard's speech, the people sitting in that large, echoing room wept. Because it re they realized that, in fact, this white, straight, middle-aged, educated, privileged man was going to be able to help them through the next three years. <clears throat> as we continue, as the United Church of Canada, to challenge systemic racism and exclusion. Richard Bott had grown up in the United Church of Canada. His only claim to being a slight outsider was that he's divorced, which is perhaps not that usual anymore. He co-parents his daughter with his uh, wife. And he now pastors a church in Vancouver, besides traveling extensively as moderator of the United Church. Through the time since Richard was a declared moderator in 2018, he has consistently spoken for those that our church most wishes to help, for those who are the most vulnerable, the most unseen, the most unprivileged, uh, valued in our society. He has spoken out on a wide range of social justice issues, and you're going to see one in a few minutes. 
And as I prepared to talk today about Richard and about the United Church of Canada, I realized that in so many ways, Richard embodies what this church is. We've been around now for 96 years, and way back in 1925, when we became the United Church of Canada, an amalgamation of 70% of all the Presbyterians in Canada, all of the Methodists in Canada at the time, and two other smaller faith groups. In that time, there was a sense of bringing all of those traditions together. It was going to give us a solid base. Of course, that's not exactly what happened. It's very hard to bring traditions together, as anyone who's ever melded households know, or brought someone new into the family knows. We all have our ways of doing things that are precious to us. And the United Church of Canada suffered lots of growing pains as we tried to bring in the formal worship of the Presbyterians and the uh, emphasis on music and education of the Methodists and the wish to reach out into social justice areas of just about everyone. We have, in the last 96 years, realized, though, that there can be tremendous strength in reforming identity. While we had strength in numbers from the amalgamation, there was a breaking down of some of the traditions and ways of being from the prior groups that came together. And in that breaking down, something new was allowed to emerge. What emerged, of course, is one of the most active social justice churches in the entire world. What emerged is a church which consistently has looked at difficult things, places where we as human beings are not living into the full love of God. And even though these things have challenged us mightily, have grown our hearts at a rate that some of us have found difficult, to, even though the world outside may already have grown, we have moved consistently in the direction of answering the question, what does love look like now? So we became the first church in Canada to ordain women. We became the first church in Canada to ordain people who are gay. We became the first church in Canada to make gay marriages just simply part of what we do. We became the first church in Canada to enter into dialogue in interfaith groups, to produce an amazing paper about our relationship to the Jewish community and the Muslim community, to talk about how we don't own the spiritual connection with God or the pathway to God, but we share with other people our thoughts about what that looks like as we listen to their ideas about how they connect with divine wisdom in the world. We became one of the first churches also to engage in indigenous reconciliation. Now, as I speak about these things, please don't hear that I feel that we have gone far enough in any of them. It's all a growth process. It's all a constant reaching into greater love through God. It's constantly a stretching. And particularly lately in our indigenous community, we have realized again how far we fell short. I'm proud, though, that in 1986, the United Church of Canada became the first faith group in the world to formally apologize to the Indigenous people. And I'm even more proud of the fact that they did it in concert with Indigenous elders. We didn't simply create what we thought the words should be. We sat and talked to those who had been so deeply harmed, continue to be so deeply harmed, and found the words that would be meaningful to them. And then we committed ourselves to living into those words. You're going to hear that apology read by Abby soon. That apology has been used as a template by faith groups and by countries all over the world as their template for their own apology to Indigenous people. It's not where we want to be, but it was a significant step in setting us on the road in that direction. I think when I read about Richard's story, what sat with me was the courage to say where we are and the commitment to look and devote ourselves to where we want to be. Because that's what Richard was doing. He was acknowledging the places where he might not have full sight, where he might not yet know enough, where he might be limited. But he also committed himself in that speech to growth, to openness, to understanding, and most of all, to listening and making space to those whose experience was different than his own. 
To me, this was a courageous speech. And he gave it at a moment when many people would have understood if he simply wanted to celebrate having become the moderator. Instead, Richard spoke humbly. Richard committed himself fully. And Richard, at the end, asked that God lead us all in the direction of greater love. I have found a place in the United Church of Canada, not because it's always perfect, but because it has given me exactly that room to grow. It has sustained me when I had to say and admit difficult things about myself. It's given me community when I have fallen short of the person I know God wants me to be. It has inspired me by the people in this church who work all over the world, bringing social justice issues to the forefront and working with communities in need to give equity and parity a chance to flourish where it has been ignored. The United Church of Canada is a church which is still growing and learning. And I think it always will be, certainly well into our next century, and I hope the century beyond. But what I find solace in is, this is a church which is able to courageously say, this is where we are, but it is not where God is going to leave us. And regardless of the courage it takes, or the constant recommitment that is necessary, we will work together and walk further together into the love of God for all people. In fact, what you hear in Richard's speech is what we say so often here at Roncesvalles United. Whoever we are, wherever we're from, whoever we love, Together, our love will transform the world. I've chosen three pieces for you to hear today. The first is Richard Bott giving a short piece urging the government of Canada and all congregants of the United Church of Canada to get vaccines to countries in need. The second is Abby Bushby reading the 1986 apology to the Indigenous people. And thank you, Abby, for doing that. And the third is one of my favorite pieces of the United Church Canada's canon, our new creed, which begins not with God is above us or Christ died for our sins, but instead starts with and ends with we are not alone. God is with us and we're in this together. Bonjour, mes amis. La COVID-19 continue d'avoir un impact dans le monde entier. Alors que nous commençons à nous en sortir au Canada, c'est loin d'être le cas pour nombre de nos frères et sœurs ailleurs dans le monde. Je vous invite à joindre votre voix à la mienne pour demander à notre gouvernement de partager les vaccins excédentaires et d'octroyer davantage de financement à COVAX, la plateforme internationale de partage de vaccins. Je demande aussi une augmentation de l'aide publique, au développement et une dérogation temporaire au brevet afin de permettre une production accrue et abordable des vaccins partout dans le monde. Now is the time for Canada to be a leader in ensuring fair and equitable vaccine access. You can do this by writing a letter to the Prime Minister and your Member of Parliament. You'll find a copy of the letter I signed as part of an ecumenical group and a sample letter you can send on our website. Please write. In addition to writing those letters, I'm asking you to donate to the COVID-19 Global Response Appeal to support our international mission and service partners who are responding to this increasingly devastating impact of COVID-19 in the communities they serve. Le Canada à l'instar de plusieurs pays occidentaux, à acheter des vaccins au-delà de ses besoins 
et devrait avoir vacciné la majorité de sa population cette année. Pendant ce temps, dans la majeure partie de la planète, seulement 0,2% de la population a été vaccinée contre ce virus. Il est peu probable que la majorité de la population mondiale soit pleinement vaccinée avant 2024. Le moment présent recueillait de solidarité internationale et des gestes concrets pour combler les fossés qui existent entre les pays riches et le reste du monde quant à l'accès vaccinal. This virus threatens every aspect of people's lives, amplifying inequalities, destabilizing communities, and reversing progress made on the sustainable development goals in the past decade. There is no time to waste. The pandemic is not over for anyone until it is over for everyone. Your voice counts. Please, join me. Thank you. In 1986, the United Church of Canada became the first church group in the world to issue an apology to the indigenous people. We repeat the words today, knowing that while we still have far to go, we walk together in faith and hope. Long before my people journeyed to this land, your people were here, and you received from your elders an understanding of creation and of the mystery that surrounds us, all that was deep and rich and to be treasured. We did not hear you when you shared your vision. In our zeal to tell you of the good news of Jesus Christ, we were closed to the value of your spirituality. In our zeal, we confused Western ways and culture with the depth and breadth and length and height of the gospel of Christ. We imposed our civilization as a condition of accepting the gospel. We tried to make you be like us, and in so doing, We helped to destroy the vision that made you what you were. As a result, you and we are poorer, and the image of the Creator in us is twisted, blurred, and we are not what we are meant to be by God. We ask you to forgive us and to walk together with us in the Spirit of Christ so that our peoples may be blessed and God's creation healed.
We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the world made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works with us, in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live in respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, cruci crucified and risen, our guide and our hope, in life and death and beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. This is the end of our recorded services for a few weeks but you are not alone. Each week for the next four weeks, we're going to give you the opportunity of traveling virtually to a different United Church of Canada in Toronto. So look in your email, look on our website every Sunday, and you'll find the link to a different United Church of Canada. I think it'll be a wonderful opportunity to share with another congregation from the comfort of your own home, and also to see how we're all a little different. I hope you enjoy those weeks. I'll be back in August. We'll continue with our big Bible adventure then. And I'll miss you in the meantime. I want to take this moment to thank so many people who have helped with these recordings for so many months and who have kept this place going. I want to thank everybody who continues to donate their time, their treasure to this place. We are weathering the storm with your help, and we're so grateful. I want to thank everyone who has contributed to the services, whether it's Henry, who's here for the first time, or Joan, who gives us a beautiful prayer every week, or Mac, or Bettina, or Lenore, or any of our scripture readers. I want to thank Maria, who continues to feed people every Saturday and Sunday on our behalf. I want to thank all of the people who do work in this amazing place. And I want to thank Sid, who stands on the other side of that iPad every week, who puts it all together, and who simply makes us look good. So when you see us again, this hair will be shorter, the roots will be back to my natural color, and we'll be counting down the weeks to having an in-person service in September. We're going to continue an online presence in some way, but we are so looking forward to being together again. So in the meantime, may the love of God and the grace of our God, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit Rest and abide upon us, each one, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>